Hello, hello, welcome, and also we're recording. So hello, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, um, so our virtual program, Getting Your Book Published. Um, with us today is a poet, fiction writer, editor, and associate professor uh, for College of DuPage, uh, Trina Sotirikopoulos, um, who will be uh, delving into the world of publishing and query letters. Um, as well as a plethora of wonderful things for uh, writers who are hoping to publish. So um, just letting you know, we are recording. And also um, in the event of any technical difficulties, give us a couple of minutes and also a little bit of grace as we try to navigate this new world of uh, COVID technology um, to bring programming to you. So without further, further ado, our presenter. Hi everyone. Um, I can't see who's here, so I don't know if I'm doing something wrong. But anyway, um, I am happy to answer any of your questions at the end. Um, I will start by, you know, just covering the various publishing markets, um, just so you have a better understanding of them. Then we'll go over query letter writing. So um, the best thing to do, I would imagine, would be the chat because I can't um, see you or hear you. So this is unlike the way I usually teach where I can see and hear everyone. Um, I see one, hi, Laura, I see one chat. Um, so anyway, it's good to see everybody, although I can't see anybody. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. I have some slides to um, give to all of you. Um, I can actually share the presentation if you wanted it. It's just a bunch of notes. My writing for publication students have these notes, have some of them, but they don't have all of them. Um, so a little background on myself, just so you guys know, I've uh, been doing this quite a while. Um, I suppose I started writing 16 years ago. I used to, I was in news before. And so um, I was writing in news after getting a degree in broadcast journalism. Um, and then I discovered that I wanted to write books. That was just something that was um, more important to me than broadcasting and doing the news. And so um, I slowly inched into publishing via children's books. Um, and then I ended up publishing a teen novel um, called In Her Skin, Growing Up Trans. Oh, I don't know where the, oh, here's the book. So um, this one was based on a friend of mine um, that I grew up with who transitioned when we were in our 20s. Um, and then I published an anthology. I've been doing anthologies lately. Um, Shifts, I don't know where that one is. Oh, here it is. Um, so Shifts was a great collection that won a couple of awards. I co-edited this with Michelle Duster and then Jen Cullerton Johnson was um, an acquisitions editor. And then this book just came out. This is impact. This has 45 writers. Um, so I have a little bit of experience and then I've published poetry and flash fiction. Um, and so this is still though, I would say writing is not my career. It's still my hobby. Obviously teaching is my career and it's my love. Um, and so, you know, I'm glad you're all here. And I, I'm, a, I, I'm a realist. I'm not going to, you know, sugarcoat anything as my students know. So you know, bear with me. I want you to think about like, why are you here even? And I actually um, have that as one of, you know, the first slides. I go by Satira and I publish under Satira. So um, that's probably why you're like, I haven't seen Satira Capitalist on any books. Um, so I want you to think about like, why did you choose this workshop? You know, what are your publishing interests? Are you thinking of yourself as a big market publisher? So are you thinking of yourself as like, you know, a, a New York Times bestseller, right? That that might be like your mondo biondo, like your um, big picture goal. Um, have you considered small market or are you looking to self-publish? Um, I'm also going to cover literary journals. Um, so, and that's also a great way to build your credentials as a writer. So think about like, why are you here? Why are you here today? despite the fact that we're all kind of stuck in our houses and there's really not a lot else to do. I'm sure there's a reason why you like want to know more about publishing. Um, literary journals is a good place to start and it's also the best place for those of you who are writing poetry. Um, so those of you publishing 
or wanting to publish your poetry or your short fiction or your creative nonfiction essays, I would highly recommend literary journals. It's it's extremely tough to get your book of poetry, you know, published or your book of short fiction, but getting piece by piece published is very realistic. Um, and what your job is as a writer, unfortunately, we're writers because we love to write. And I say unfortunately because there's this other part of it, which is submitting. And submissions can take up just as much time, if not more time than the writing. So that becomes extremely frustrating um, for those who didn't plan on that. Um, let me just take a peek at the chat and see. Um, wanted to publish a children's book, poetry, and had a poem published in a children's magazine many years ago. And now that I'm retired, I'd love to move forward with children's book. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about children's book publishing, Rose. I'm so glad you said that. Looking at your um, poems and saying, like, can I um, publish any of these in a literary journal? That's a good place to start. And so, what I'm suggesting is that you start to build your credentials if you don't already have them. And so, you want to start to look to see um, who is publishing what I write. Okay. And so, let me show you where to go. So, if you write poetry, um, so someone like Rose you know, who writes poetry, um, I would highly recommend looking over at Poets and Writers Literary Magazine's um, submissions guides. And you can choose your genre, so you can choose poetry. If you have a subgenre, like maybe you um, write more feminist poetry, um, you can filter your results and then see who's looking for work that you write, okay? Um, Literary journals pay in like the field. You know what I mean? It's like, it's good for your soul to get published. Like, um, as you all know, when you get published, it's like, man, it's, you know, it's just another notch, right? You're so excited, but there's like really no money. I mean, it's very rare that you're gonna get any money out of publishing a literary journal. But remember what you are getting is experience and you're getting credentials, right? So you're building credentials to add um, to your, query letter, which we're going to cover, okay? Um, you'll notice that literary journals have specific interests, and they only want to publish specific work, right? So you have to do your homework, and that's the part where I said, like, so it could take you 10 minutes to write, like, this fantastic poem, right? But to find the right home for that poem could take you weeks, if not months, um, and there are all kinds of guidelines, right? Every publisher or every literary journal has guidelines. And so I'm showing you Cutthroat because they're just absolutely a, a fantastic literary journal, but they only take submissions August through October. So we're, we're out of luck right now, aren't we? You can't submit to them again until next August. So it's like you might as well hold on to that poem if you know it's just for Cutthroat. Um, Another thing uh, to see, let's see, click here to submit via submittable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I want to show you submittable, but it's hard for me to see when I have this little bar up here. So sorry, I'm like squinting over here. What's this one? That's new pages. That's another helpful. Okay, so submittable, you need a login and a password and it's free, okay? Um, so hopefully you guys, can you guys see my submittable page? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Laura's writing memoir. Okay, Christy. Thanks, Liz. Okay, so um submittable, I absolutely love. I use it quite often. Um I I typically I typically try to submit on Friday afternoons. I don't know why. Um sometimes are Sunday afternoons. So um one of my friends Long ago, a great children's book writer, Laura Crawford, um, was an inspiration to me. And you know, she passed away several years ago, but she still, you know, her her like words and her aura still remain, as you all know, if you you know when you suffer a loss. And Laura would submit every Friday. Friday was not a writing day. Friday was a submission day. And so I try to put that in my head, like submit on Friday. It doesn't happen when I'm teaching, but in the, you know, like in the in-between breaks and things like that, I'm like pretty regimented about that. But Submittable does have the fee um, submissions, but it also like you could filter it out and say, I don't want to pay any fee. 
And I also am only submitting poetry or, you know, I haven't talked about fiction, but yeah, let's do fiction. Um, let's take out poetry. Can I do that? Let me see. Um, let me just do fiction. Or you know what, let's do nonfiction. We haven't talked about that. So it will help you see like who is taking work that you write, okay? And you could even go further and say like, I write nature. Um, I wanna look for, you know, people looking for nonfiction nature. Well, there's only one. Well, good. Well, I'm gonna try that, right? Um, they will also, submittable also, um, the reason why I love them is they give you, um, the most recent deadlines first, okay? So today, if I'm like gung-ho and I wanna get, I wrote something about COVID, let's say, right? And I wanna get it out. Um, so this'll show you what, you know, the deadlines um, are and who's taking work, okay? And as you see, there are these, um, you know, a lot of these uh, literary journals have a thematic focus. I highly recommend though with um, submittable, that you look at the website, okay? And the reason why I say that is because sometimes, like I don't know this Valley Review, Meet for Tea, um, sometimes it's something you haven't heard of and it's maybe something you don't want to submit to. I'm not saying that about this particular, I'm just using it as an example, I'm sorry, Meet for Tea. Um, I'm sure they're a lovely journal, but um, yeah, so just do your legwork. And like I said, it's a lot of legwork. Um, the other one is uh, New Pages. New Pages is absolutely fantastic for submission calls. So, so far I've told you about three places you can go find to publish your work. Because I imagine you're in this workshop because you want to figure out how to publish your work. So you would try Poets and Writers um, under their submissions because uh, they have the catalog of submissions. You would try Submittable or you would try new pages. And I haven't shown you new pages as I told you, it's really tough for me to see up here. Okay, so this is new pages. Um, and again, they run the most recent um, deadlines first. So um, typically they do, oh no, the most recent posts, my apologies. Um, but again, you can see, I actually think new pages is quite reputable. These um, organizations, we've used them actually for our anthologies. Um, you have to pay to um, have a submission call posted. Um, for those of you new to this, it's called a submission call or a call for submissions. Um, but the organization, the journal, et cetera, the press has to pay for it. So it does show you that it can't be like a fly-by-night website that's just taking work, okay? Um, all right, so beyond literary journals, um do your research i told you about that yeah so a literary journal just takes like a cover letter you don't really need a query with that like you're not saying like hey would you want to see my work you're already sending your work um what you do need though is a good sentence or two like is this poem or essay or piece of fiction what is it based on how are you connected to it you may want to tell them uh the publisher how it's connected to their interests or their thematic focus um, and then they typically want a 50 word bio. So that's like you saying who you are. Um, we, in this last anthology I co-edited, um, we asked for 50 word bios. So, um, oh, I picked a, an example where he like has a lot, but um, for example, Richard Downing has like, so his bio is as follows. Richard Downing has received the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation Peace Poetry Prize, Writer Corner Press Editors Award, New Delta Reviews, Matt Clark Prize, and Solstice Literary Magazine's Editors Award. He holds a PhD in English and is a co-founder of both the Florida Peace Action Network and Save Our Nation Post. Now, that's one writer who has a, just a ton of experience and a ton of credentials, right? But here's another. A.J. Chilson was born in Dallas in 1984. He began to write poetry as a teenager. Since then, Chilson has published books of poetry as well as children's stories. He currently lives in Princeton, Texas. So a very short bio works as well. So now you have an idea of how to go find work, right? Meaning like where can you submit your work? And then also how do you write a bio about yourself, okay? Small market publishing, 
um, is another way to go. So that's for those of you who are like, I have a book, but it's pretty niche. Like it's a Chicago book or um, I've seen books about Lake Geneva or it's an activist book, like this book that I just published. Like, so it has like this very small niche. Um, and the other thing is maybe you really like like Haymarket books who published Angela Davis and other activists. Um, Haymarket asks for books that change the world or that's their motto, books for changing the world. So a news right press that the press that Michelle and I co-founded, we want stories for underrepresented voices. So most of these and curbside splendor is mainly Chicago writers. Okay. So a lot of these um, small presses, they might publish between zero and five books a year, if that, right? They have small print runs, the writers in charge of um, getting their work uh, through marketing, right? You're not going to get any marketing backing with a small press. Um, hey, market, let me just show you. So, or you could look on your own, but they do, you know, have some wonderful, you know, wonderful celebrated writers, but then they also have some newer writers. So, well, e-viewing, I mean, there's some big, big writers here. Um, but that's not to say that you're not the next e-viewing or the next big writer. Um, I wouldn't rule out small presses. I think um, Haymarket is, you know, probably on the verge of not so small, but you definitely, Haymarket actually published Koval, Kevin Koval, uh, both of his books, um, People's History of Chicago, and then um, Everything Must Go. So you'd be in good hands with that publisher, okay? Um, but again, small market is small print run, um, and you would need a face, meaning, or a brand, right? So you'd be in charge of, you know, uh, being on social media, getting the word out about your book, um, telling your friends about it, et cetera, et cetera, hope, hoping to sell more copies, going to bookstores or emailing bookstores, et cetera, okay? So that's the reality of it. Um, and then there's commercial publishing. So like the big houses, like we now in the past, I would say 10 years, I've seen a lot of marriages between various publishing houses. So we have these like huge conglomerates now. Um, Simon & Schuster is a good example where you're, you'll see imprints and actually they have a new imprint um, that's launching one of my friend, uh, my friend Michelle Duster, my co-editor. Um, they're they're launching new new titles this year, so that's always a good way to get in to see like who's who's launching new work, right? Um, who's launching new imprints? They may be more willing to look at your work. Um, Penguin is now Penguin Random House. It used to be Penguin and Random House. It was Penguin Putnam and Random House. Um, so. The big publishers are for those of you who are writing commercial work that will reach a large audience, right? Um, what you must know about this, and I've had friends publish with these big publishers and then they're disappointed when they don't have like big marketing campaigns. So the publishers will pick certain books to be their big book, right? That, and they'll have a big team, like have eight people on a marketing team to get that book out, right? Um, Costco will buy like, tens of thousands of copies, et cetera. Um, but I've had friends who just are published with a big house and then they will on their book launch day, go to a bookstore. One of my friends in the past went to this bookstore and said like, my book launched today and they didn't know about it. Like you as the author have to say like, can you carry my book? Um, so big houses are great. Uh, they will reach people, right? And you can get into, um, especially for children's book writers, you can get into Scholastic Book Club, um, schools, et cetera. So there is a great advantage to that. There's a caveat though, and that is you'll more than likely need an agent, okay? Um, and so I'll get to that. Like, how do you get an agent? I see a question. Would literary journals be helpful for those interested? Yeah. So, Miranda, I think that's a great question. And I would say that any, any clip, any publishing in the Daily Herald, publishing in a literary journal, publishing in the Prairie Light Review at DOD, any clips that you build 
you will continue continue to build clips, right? Because you'll notice when we write our queries, you'll see that you need to say like where you've been published or what your experience with your with writing is. Um, you can be a new writer. A lot of publishers, especially commercial publishers, are looking for like the, your first book, and that is they don't be, and that's because you don't have a path, so they don't know like they can't gauge. How many copies will this book sell? How many copies did this author sell last time? They've got no barometer for that. So they're going to take a risk on a new author. But um, yes, any, so I don't want any of you to feel pinned into writing only for children or only for adults or only poetry or only fiction. Um, Roy Peter Clark mentions that in Murder Your Darlings. Oftentimes, um, you will write multiple genres. And sometimes if you're, an, if, if you're an expert or a hobbyist in a certain field, if you love butterflies, if you've written a children's book about butterflies and your poetry is about butterflies and you've got a creative nonfiction essay about butterflies, that's fantastic, right? Keep your knowledge base and reach as many avenues as you can. There's not, no rule that says, because you've published in a literary journal, you don't belong in children's book, pub, book publishing. In fact, I would argue that the more experience you have writing period and publishing period will only help you, right? Because you need the experience of working with an editor or an agent. You know, the collaboration is a big part of writing for publication, huge part. I can't tell you how many students I've had um, who don't, openly accept feedback. And that is a that will that will shut you down as a writer. And I so that's something to think about. Like are you writing for yourself? For your child? Well great. Well then share it with yourself and your child, right? Or are you writing for an audience? And then you need to define that audience, right? And if you are writing for an audience and you are going to try to publish that work, you have to be willing to work with an editor, right? Um, that's just the reality of it. It's a collaboration. It's, I, I always tell my students, it's not a painting. I wish it was, right? Where you, you, you create your art and that's it. You're not going back and you're not gonna add more layers of paint and glaze and whatever else. I don't even know anything about painting. Um, it's just a painting and it's just there with writing. Those words can go away. They can, you know, your sentences can get longer, can get shorter. Whole paragraphs can go away, whole chapters can go away. So you have to be willing to, you know, give that up. Um, I see a question, you know, hmm. would, oh, would like to answer this question live. Noelle, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Do I, um, do I have to do something to let you do that? Oh, sorry. No, um, I just, um, uh, I just marked it off as uh, being answered live because that was the question that I think you you've answered. Oh, okay. So I don't have to do anything else. No, you're you're all set. Okay. All right. Um. Oh, I keep wanting my arrows to work like on my keyboard, but it's I have to click over here. Okay. So, you know what? Self is here, but let me do academic, and then I'll go back to self. Okay. So academic is. And I mentioned like perhaps a topic for another day, but some of you, I think like, and some of my students too, they want to publish their academic essays or their academic work. And the one thing to know is typically people publishing in an academic journal are scholars, right? Or they're graduate students or budding scholars. So um, from what I know about academic journals, they accept about 2% of what gets sent. 2% um, without conditions. Otherwise, the, the researchers that are sending in their articles usually have to go back and rerun their data, or they have to go find another study to compare their data to, or they, you know, they have to like tweak what they've sent in, okay? And th this is for empirical research. So you're going out and you're collecting, you know, quantitative or qualitative data, and then you're reporting it. That's usually what academic publishers want, right? They want that empirical research, the original research. Um, oh, I saw another question, but I, okay, I don't see it now. Um, and then academic book publishing, which you, pro you probably are more familiar with, 
this would be like someone like Macmillan. Um, academic book publishing is great for people who have written, oops, sorry, their um, dissertation and they want it published. I've got like this box, I don't know what it is, sorry. I can't go back to that now. Um, or it's someone who um, has something like super niche that might do well in a college classroom. But the one thing to know about academic publishers is that you, um, you can, you could spend, and this is the reality, remember I told you this is going to be realistic with you, you might spend like five years on this project and you can, you're going to earn, and so you remember college students will pay like a hundred and something dollars for this book, let's say, um, as a writer, you might earn enough for a trip to the grocery store. And so most of the time, the people that are publishing in, a, in an acad with an academic press are those who are already uh, professors and they have a, a contractual requirement to publish. Um, and so then it's worth it because then there's either a raise associated with it or tenure associated with it. But for those of you who aren't in, in, in academia or aren't professors, um, academic publishing may might not be like the way to go to get your book published, okay? Um, also, academic publishers don't typically edit. They, the book should be refined and ready and the author is in charge of the editing. Um, so there's a lot of pressure put on the writer um, to get that work perfect and then out. And then again, <laughs> one of my friends says, you, you, you can now afford cheese on your cheeseburger. Like that's really it uh, with academic publishing. So not for everybody, but for those of you who maybe that would help you professionally. Um, and so then finally there's self-publishing. And so for self-publishing, I would say this is great for those of you who have a book that is for a certain market that you are already in contact with, right? So, and for those of you who are, who like to always be in control of every single thing and don't want anyone to touch the work at all. Um, so, and I say that because Self-publishing, you are in charge of everything, right? And so I mentioned here, you're going to want to save at least $1,500 because you're going to have to pay for printing. But before you pay for printing, you definitely don't want to just print a manuscript because it's like lovely and you just love it and your friends all like it and you must get it out there. You have to take a step back and say like, how do I get this into the hands of more people? And how do I put my best work out there? Well, you have to hire a professional, which costs money, right? So you're gonna want a book cover designer. You're going to want a formatting editor. You're gonna want a copy editor. And you might even want beyond someone copy editing, you might want a second editor to like, just to do like another round of edits or micro edit. So you might want a content editor to help you, like if it's fiction, to help you, maybe you need help with historical details. And then you're going to want your line editor, right, to deal with all the grammar and things. So there are a lot of hands in, you know, in your in your book or on your book, and you have to save for that, you know, to be able to do that. So and then, so now your book's on Amazon. Well, you have, you know, no backing, right? So you want to think about self-publishing only if you have, you know, context in the industry, right? or your speaker. I see a lot of like speakers um, who self-publish their books because they have a target audience. They're getting paid to speak all over the place, even if it's via Zoom, and um, they can then sell their book, okay? Um, but I do think, and I must say, um, self-publishing is great for, for those of you who have not had good luck getting your book published, yet everybody who reads it loves it, right? Your critique group, um, professional writing group, et cetera. They love it, um, but maybe it's just that it's so niche. I know that when I tried to get In Her Skin published, I was told this is too niche, 
right? This was 2008, 2009. Nobody wanted a trans teen novel. There are already two. People weren't even accepting of the transgender community. So when I did get an agent, it was because he was like a savior for LGBTQ plus books. And the, his authors, he had RuPaul as one of his authors, um, Bill Koningsberg. So he repped people who had books that he believed in and he strongly believed in the book. So you, you must know this story needs readers and you must believe in it, okay? You must know you were chosen to write that. And if that's the case, and if people aren't picking up your book, you can't give up, right? And that's why I think some people do self-publish. Um, I had a question, I believe. And then we're gonna get to query letter writing. Expense with a long novel. You know what? I don't know that, but I did have a little slide about children's books, Miranda. And I'll, I think it's over here. Yeah, so I, I'll get to your answer ish. Um, I don't think there's a difference in expense though by page. So, but what I wanted to show you for self publishing, there's Amazon, KDP, or there's Ingram Spark. Okay. Oh, you also, I think you have to buy an Isman too. Um, did I do children's book? Let me see. Oh, you know what? I don't have it here. So I'll just explain that to you then, Miranda. So with children's books, I'm hesitant to say self-publish a children's book. And the reason why I believe in children's book publishers, I have been a member, although I'm not like, I don't think I've renewed my, new, my dues this year because I haven't written for kids in a long time. Um, that I was an SCBWI member for at least 14 years. That's the Society of Children's Book Writers. Those editors love kids and they love books and they want to help kids understand the world through those books. And I love those editors. I really do. The children's writing community is amazing. Amazing. I've never seen a community like that anywhere in any professional realm. And so, my point is, if you listen to the feedback you get from, from the editor, so for example, you have a picture book, two editors tell you or two agents tell you it's just too long. They know, they know what the libraries want. They know what Scholastic Book Fair wants. They know what um, the schools want. And so you have to listen, right? Um, People who self-publish kids' books, I see them on Twitter, and I'm always wondering, like, how do you get kids to read your book? And that's always, like, the big question where those publishers, those publishers who love, love, love kids, right, they love them. They know what, what they need to purchase, right, because they know what their readers want. So um, if you have if you are a li children's librarian and you know children's librarians and you can get your self-published kids book into libraries, then self-publish, right? But I would say that standard 32 page spread for a picture book. Now the word count, man, it used to be like around 1,800 words. I think it keeps shrinking so that you'd wanna double check. So if you are to self-publish children's books, and I'm not suggesting that you do, I'm suggesting that you do like if you've exhausted all of their avenues and you have a market in your hands that you can distribute to, I highly recommend um, joining a professional group like STBWI um, and looking to see the standards. You want to follow industry standards. And there are, I should, you know what, I did lead a panel years ago for the SCBWI with independent writers. And there were two writers. One was a children's picture book writer, award-winning writer from um, Wisconsin. And another one, uh, Sylvia Acevedo, she was a middle grade writer, I believe. They both had great success, but they worked their tails off, right? Um, the one was a children's picture book writer and also an artist. And so I think that she did all of the art you know, by hand in her home, et cetera. Um, darn it, I wish I remembered her name, I'm sorry, I don't. But the point is, if you like are the author illustrator and you know the market and you know what you should be doing, then try it, right? 
SCBWI. Yeah, Skibwe, Society of Children's Books Writers and Illustrators. And I that they are my family. I, I haven't seen some of those writers in years. And they're honestly, you'll see the most loving community. And in fact, the the if you guys are all in Illinois, the um Illinois group has several regional critique groups. Um, and I actually remember years ago sitting in Barnes and Noble, which I don't think you can do right now with COVID, but we all sat at the kids' table in the kid lit section and on the little plastic chairs and read our manuscripts. And, um, you know, we developed some long, long relationships and leaned on each other. And a lot of my friends from those groups published, right? Um, some of Sherry Collier has had some great success. Um, Kim Brunner has had some great success. Um, Sarah Barthel, yeah, Natalie Rampello. This is like making me teary to think about. But yes, so join an organization. And um, that's one of my, you know, I, I can't recommend that enough. You need people to read your work. You are writing for publication, right? Publication means you're writing for readers. So you need readers to help you see, you know, is what you're saying, does it make sense? Is it clear? Does that make sense? Do you guys have any other questions before I get to query letter writing? And for query letter, I want you guys to get like a pen and paper or, you know, try to try to write and get some of this out. I've got the chat up, so. All right, I'll move to query and then if a chat question pops up, I will uh, take a peek. Um, so query, a query is extremely important. I can't tell you like the, the strength of this letter. Um, a lot of agents only want a query letter. So you imagine you've spent three, four years writing this book or picture book or um, this fiction, you know, this novel that's like your masterpiece and you're ready to send it out and you find out they don't even want to read it. They just want a letter that describes the book and it, it's a gut punch, right? You've written maybe 80,000 words of a novel. They don't want to read it. They just want to hear you sell it to them, right? So a strong query letter is key, okay? And so I'm going to show you two different query letters. Um, I've got to close some of these. Okay, well, I guess I don't have to close them, but um, there are two ways to write a query letter. The first would be to start with your pitch, so to start with your book pitch. And the second would be to start with like why you're contacting this publisher or this agent. Um, in this case, this is a writer writing to an agent um, and they start with the pitch, the book pitch. Great lace preschool teacher, Lizzie Brown, never lies, never cusses and doesn't really care much for surprises. When her long lost grandma Gertie shows up on our doorstep writing a neon pink Harley Davidson wearing a kiss my asphalt t-shirt and hauling a carpet bag full of smuckers jars filled with roadkill magic, Lizzie doesn't think her life could get any stranger. That is until her hyperactive terrier starts talking and an accident or an ancient demon decides to kill her from his perch on the back of her toilet. It's just a lot of like uh, unique language and description. Um, and down here, we see what's being pitched. The Accidental Demon Slayer is an 85,000 word humorous paranormal. Reminds me kind of of like Chuck uh, Palahniuk, the um, doomed book. Okay, anyway, um, I'm a member of RWA. I think that's the Romance Writers of America because I think I judged one of their contests years and years ago. And the partial manuscript placed first in the Windy City RWA's Four Seasons contest. That's interesting. The judge for that contest, like, so like, you know, requested the full. So a full request is a big deal. Just if you guys don't have experience with this, you might query like 10, 15, 20 people and you might not even get anything or you might get like a form rejection, like 
thanks for contacting us. It just isn't right for us, right? And you're like, well, what in the hell? Like, what's not right? You know what I mean? Is it my character? Is it my plot? Is it my language? Is it like, am I a horrible writer? Like you go through all these things when really maybe they just published a book just like yours, like, and it's already on their, or maybe it's on their list and they're gonna bring it out in January or something. So um, keep these things in mind. Right. I, I could show you piles of I think I've like burned most of the uh, queries. In fact, I, I used to do that years ago on the grill. Um, I would like burn them because it's like hell, it's fun and it's like, you know, cathartic. Um, and now I'm just like delete, you know, what I mean? or I'll, I always thank them if they say something that they do. But anyway, um, you get this one line with credentials. As an advertising writer, I've won multiple awards for my work in radio dialogue, but that doesn't tell me anything about what they've published. So that's actually great news for a writer um, and for you guys who maybe haven't published a lot of work. This is like a, kind of like a crossover. An advertising writer is still a writer, but not necessarily like published a lot of work or in literary journals or anything like that, but did win this contest. So that is big. Um, and then you just, you know, thank them for their time and tell them, you know, you can send them whatever they want. Um, one thing to know, so to find an agent, use agent query. I like agent query. Um, and that's for those of you who have a children's book that's um, probably a bigger market children's book that I would, picture books still have agents actually. Um, so, and, and then also those of you who publish fiction. So, and then nonfiction, like memoir, et cetera. Those of you who are writing essays and poetry, mainly you're okay without an agent, right? Um, agent query, you put in like your genre and you, et cetera, and then you search and you'll get a ton of agents. Um, you also wanna keep a spreadsheet. And this is something, I can't remember, Kristen, Kristen Walker taught me to do this. Um, you need a spreadsheet. This is for an, a book I had, I think this is a book on boxing that still hasn't sold. I co-wrote it with a boxer. Um, it's, I just don't know about a book for middle grade readers about boxing. I'm not sure what's gonna happen with that. But um, so you keep a, keep a list of the agency, um, who you sent it to, when did you send it, what's their email, and then maybe what did they say, okay? What did, like how many pages did you send them, et cetera. So, being organized is super, super, super important, okay? Um, as you can see, I'm not talking anything about writing right now, which is like, just isn't that a kicker? Because it's like, we're all writers. And then you spend so much time. I've had friends who haven't written for years um, because they're just like, they'll query and they get the book published and then they're spending time marketing. So, uh, so, okay, yeah. This one went to Dan Lazar. Dan Lazar is awesome. He's with the Writer's House. Um, so this is a different way to write the query. This is what I teach my students, where you tell them like why you've contacted them and then you pitch your book, okay? Um, and that way too, like off the bat, they um, have an idea that you did your homework. You're not just like sending to every agent in the world. Um, you're picking and choosing exactly why you're sending to someone and who you want to send to. Um, so recently completed a historical novel and read se several interviews that you enjoy historical fiction and just characters. So I'm hoping that you'll like my book. And then here's the pitch. Here's who the person is. Born and raised in New Hampshire. I live in Switzerland where I teach to write. I've published half a dozen stories in American literary journals. And then you see the journals. And then, yeah, Dan likes the first five pages. So this is again, why you have to do your homework and why I like keeping a spreadsheet because then I know like, okay, I sent them five, they wanted a full or I sent them nothing. They just wanted the query, that type of thing. Okay. Um, so your query for you guys to write one, these are the things you're gonna wanna do. Um, I don't know how much time we still have. 15 minutes or 12 minutes. So you may want to just take this time just to jot down some notes. Cause I know like with Zoom presentations, it's like you're in the moment, but then you're not, right? And then you like walk away and it's like, what happened? What did I learn? 
Um, so you may want to take a moment to write these following things. Um, you're going to want to pitch your work, right, in this query. Um, and in that pitch, you want to say, again, if you are going to write one of those intros where you're saying, like, how you know the person, then say that. It is also helpful. I've heard a lot of agents and editors say they want to know the word count and they want to know the genre and the title, right? Um, or you might go with the other example, that paranormal example, where you're like, maybe you have the best pitch for your book, then start with that, okay? Sometimes you'll notice you're going to have two paragraphs that um, summarize your book. Um, so just take a few moments to write that down, right? You know, section one, either introduce you know yourself and why you're contacting this person um and then you know how long is the book etc or come up with a nice you know catchy summary And then the other section, so we call this the third paragraph or third section, you want to start to list your credentials. And now if you haven't published anything, you don't have the writing credentials, but don't rule out any organizations you're a part of. Okay, so you may wanna just jot down like, you know, last section, organizations. And those organizations might be related to the topic you wrote about. So they may not necessarily be writers organizations, but maybe, again, you wrote about butterflies and I don't know the scientific uh, word for butterflies, but maybe you're part of that group and you wanna say that, right? Or maybe, um, you know, I remember when uh, Audrey Neffenegger, I um, can't remember the name of the book, Fearful Symmetry maybe was the name of the novel, but she actually took a part-time job in a cemetery in uh, London in order to write that book. And if I were an editor taking, you know, a look at fiction like that, and I saw that a writer took the time to work part time at a cemetery in order to get, you know, have good research and to have perfect details, I would definitely be interested, even if they didn't have the writing experience. So obviously we all know Neffenegger has a ton of experience. She's amazing. But um, that's something to consider, right? So don't rule out your experience as credential, okay? Um, but other than that, yeah, so if you are part of a writer's organization, any classes you've taken, um, and any writing you've done in other fields, okay? Certainly any awards, um, but we're all not that, you know, it's like we're, we're not that lucky. And sometimes I don't know if that even matters. If this is your first novel, say it. And like I told you, you know, some editors, they want to jump on that. Um, please don't say things though, like, you know, I've shared this with all my family and they love this story. Well, you know, sometimes they love it just to like save face and they don't, you know, um, and that doesn't always appear as professional. And I've also heard horror stories of editors receiving queries with like trinkets and things. And, and that's something you don't need to do. And nowadays, everything's email. Um, attending conferences is another great way to meet agents and editors, even if it's a virtual conference. And typically, if you attend those conferences, they'll say, you can query me for the next six months. I'll, I'll, they'll have open queries because sometimes editors, obviously a lot of editors don't take unsolicited work. So they're only gonna take work from agents that they know um, that they're working with. So that's a big foot in the door, 
right? So that's another way to do it. So basically you, and actually Dan Lazar in that article I shared, he said sometimes he'll use parts of the query when he's pitching editors. So keep that in mind. If you, can, if you can't sell your work to an editor or agent, how are they going to sell it to the public? So that's one thing to do, you know, do your homework. How do you, how are you going to pitch your work and sell it? Okay, question. If going the commercial route, is it best to work first with an agent and then work with them to go to publishing? I would say, yeah, yes. Um, agents know what editors want. Does that make sense? So getting with an agent, they'll know, they're, they're gonna pick up your book because they'll have an editor already in mind. They'll have an editor and 10 others in mind, right? And they'll know how to sell it. When you get an agent, one thing to keep in mind is it's hands off. Like I remember with my agent, we touch base every few months, but like for like two months, I'd be like, who has my book? Like what's going on? And you just don't know, right? So as I mentioned, you know, earlier in the presentation, you must know that this is a collaboration. And so you must trust, you have to trust the system, okay? Um, you don't want to go file your book in the copyright, you know, with the U.S. copyright and then like send it to them and say like, this is copyrighted material. They'll know you don't trust them, right? The minute you email someone something, you've got a record saying, I created this and I sent this to you on this day and this time. So that's not always something to worry about. But, you know, Miranda, I would say do the legwork and try to get an agent first. There are editors, though, that are you know, that will take work from unagented writers and then go for it. But um, from my experience with my friends who have published with bigger publishers, the agent's the way to go. Uh, question, is the writing for the COD newspaper something to list? Yes, I would say yes. So it's a credential, you're published, you have an audience reading your work, you have experience working with editors, yes and yes. Mm -hmm. Um, you might be a little um, strategic about the way you word it. You know, you could say something like, um, I'm a, you know, whatever kind of writer. I don't know what, what, what's your beat, but I'm an X type writer for the courier in Glen Ellen, right? Um, that's if you don't want to like align yourself with a college newspaper and you're just like listing the name because I'm curious if the reader, the query reader will actually like go do the legwork and like, you know, go find out if it's a college newspaper or not. Okay, other questions. Does payment for the agent come first or after a lot of the legwork? So the agent makes money when you start to get paid as a writer. So they don't get paid first and you should never as a writer pay an agent. They're gonna make a percentage. Your contract with that agent will state what percentage they make of your royalties, okay? If you go to editors on your own, beware of vanity presses, yes. So thanks, Karen. Um, vanity presses, are, are you referring to those that like you have to pay them? I mean, I think Miranda's question and Karen's comments are are protecting you. You know, you need to protect yourself as a writer. Yes, and yeah, thanks, Karen. Yeah, so no, you should never have to pay a publisher to publish your work. Though there is something called partner publishing that I've heard of. A friend of mine partner published, and I think what I can't remember what she did. This was like ten something years ago. I think you front part of the money and then they front part of the money. Does that make sense? That's called partner publishing. Um, but no, you shouldn't have to pay to publish your work because in that case, just go do KDP, KDP or um, Ingram. Yeah. What other questions? I think we're like wrapping up here. We've got four more minutes. I hope this was helpful in some way. In the chat, uh, someone mentioned what's a normal percentage, which I'm guessing it's from uh, the agent takes. Oh, the agent, I'm familiar with 15%, but um, 
yeah, I would, I don't know. I, that's something to Google. I'm sorry. That's something um, that I'm, it's, you have a contract with your agent. And so it's something that you either agree to or you don't agree to. Um, but I think that's something you might want to Google or ask a, a literary attorney about like, you know, when you get into that situation, it is important to, you know, to protect yourself. Most of those contracts are only, you know, for the, the uh, publisher or for the agency. They're not really as beneficial for the writer. So um, make sure that you have uh, an attorney look over your contract before you sign it. 15% for book, uh, 20 for foreign and film. Okay. Yeah. And I, I, it might vary. No, Dave, great question. Okay. So Multiple submissions are fantastic. And, uh, you know, in the, man, sometimes like, I remember I got like a response from an agent and I think it was like a year later and I was like, oh my God, I don't even remember sending this to you. Um, so can you imagine if you waited one year to get a no or no thank you, like a sweet no thank you. And then you sent to another and waited another year. I mean, I'd be in the ground by the time I like got any kind of response. So um, what I would say, or I would definitely say, all you need to do is A, make sure that the agents or editor or literary journal doesn't have a rule about multiple submissions. Um, some literary journals don't want to read multiple submissions. So then you don't submit to them or then you, you know that that's the place and so you only submit to them. But what you do in the query is in that last, uh, here, I wrote it here, but it says end by, sorry, um, end by saying that it's a multiple submission, okay? Um, and also if you have fulls out, full, now full is the key word for like everyone jumps on your book. Um, I was lucky enough to be in this position years ago. This is when I got my agent where I had a few fulls out and I was in LA at a conference and yeah, just things worked really well. It was just like, all the stars align. But if you do have a full out, say that, right? This is a multiple submission. I've got one full out or two folds, full meaning your full manuscript is out there. And someone had requested it. And it was okay. No. Dave, thanks for asking that question. I yeah, multiple submissions are like key. Back in the day, you guys. You used to have to mail your manuscript, the whole thing, and you weren't supposed to send multiple submissions, or at least that was my experience. I remember just like, Man. you'd actually have to send a postcard too, like to, for them to send back to you. It was almost miserable. Any other questions? I know it's three, so it's probably time to wrap up, but. All right, so uh, if you guys want, you know, if you, oh, that's the beauty is shape is great. Yeah, there's a Naperville area chapter, Oak Park. Yeah, they do. Skibley is great. Um, OCWW is another great place to check out. Um, Susan Winstead, who's now on the advisory board for the Creative Writing Certificate at COD, she was on, on the board for OCWW, so Off Campus Writers Workshop is a fantastic and pretty free. It might be like 10 or 15 bucks uh, to attend a session. Yeah, Dave, thanks for coming. Yeah, so if you guys have any further questions, just email me. Um, I can, hang on, I'm just gonna leave my email address for COD in the chat here. Um, Wait, where did it go? Oh, send, sorry. Um, I can't multitask. Did you guys get that or did it end up, go, it might have only gone to Karen. Um, well, did, did you all see that? If you'd like, I can go ahead and put it in the, sorry, in the, in the chat box. That would be helpful. So yeah, just email me. Like, so if anyone wants these slides, um, or if you uh, have further questions, just email me, okay? But thank you so much for visiting on a two o'clock on a Saturday. 
Um, and I wish you all the best and don't give up. Um, this could take one year and it could take 12. Um, I've, I've um, heard about both um, sides of the spectrum. So um, don't give up, right? If you know your story should get out there or your poem or um, your essay or your fiction or your children's book, um, don't give up, right? And it might not be that book, that particular book, the way you have it, but it could be a variation of that. So if there's this idea that you want to get out there, yeah, I would definitely not give up on it, okay? All right. Um, you didn't get the email, Laura. Okay, I think that Xavier is going to be posting the email address somehow. Yep, there it is. Thanks, Karen. Okay, everyone. Thank you so much for visiting. Nice to talk. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and then, yeah, the email is um, in the chat box. Um, however, if um, after we close and you lose the email, feel free to email me um, through the program description. Um, I will also have the recording available soon, um, soon-ish. Um, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. And um, thank you to everyone who were, were able to uh, join us tonight, this afternoon. Thank you. Okay, bye, thank you.